been looking at stories of call, and the one that John just read definitely is a story of call, the call of Esther to step beyond her comfort zone. What we're going to read now is not a call story from Luke, and this is a, this is a passage that would show up in the lectionary in November, but we've got some sermon series going on. So we're going to read this one a little bit early. It comes from the 21st chapter of Luke, which to put it in context, you need to know this comes near the end of Jesus' ministry on earth and near the end of his life. And this is what he is saying to his disciples. It's what's called an apocalyptic writing that's talking about the, the end times that are to come. So the language is a little not comfortable for us to listen to, not what we're used to hearing from Jesus. But this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. But the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. For I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How many of you were alive in the 1980s? Do you all remember this television commercial? This was one of the most irksome commercials of all time. Do you know who Kelly LeBrock was? She's still alive. Who Kelly LeBrock is? She was a good looking girl and she was making Pantene commercials and she would wave her hair and do, do those kind of things and she would say, don't hate me for what? Don't hate me for being beautiful which immediately made most of the world hate her. <laughs> but then she said, if you buy this shampoo, you'll look just like me. And I went out and bought the shampoo, and guess what? I didn't look like her. <laughs> Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. That could be sort of the subtext of the story of Esther. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. How many of you know the full story of Esther? You should. If you haven't read it in a few years, you probably ought to get it out and read it again. Esther is a fascinating story. Esther didn't start out being called Esther. She had a Jewish name. What was her Jewish name? Here is your, I will give you some of my Wilbur Buds because I got some new chocolate today. If you can tell me the, if you didn't go to seminary, Elizabeth, if you can tell me Esther's Jewish name. Oh, we got to do some Bible study here. Hadassah. You're all going, oh yeah, Hadassah. Hadassah. She was named Hadassah. And she lived with Mordecai, who was her kinsman. She was an orphan. We're not sure if he was her uncle or her cousin, but he was her kinsman. And they were living in what's called the dispersion or the diaspora, the Jews who did not return after the exile. And they're living in a place that we used to call Persia or the Persian Empire, which was very extensive, covered lots of territories, covered many time zones and languages. And the ruler was named King Xerxes. And King Xerxes was already married. He had a wife named Vashti. King Xerxes knew how to live large. He lived like a king. It's good to be the king. Have you heard that expression? Mm -hmm. He had a party that went on for 180 days. That's six months of partying. And they partied hardy in those days. And near the end, he called Queen Vashti to come out because she was considered to be the most beautiful woman around. Don't hate her because she's beautiful. And he commanded her to parade in front of his friends wearing her crown. Biblical scholars debate. Some say that was all she was allowed to wear. But either way, he said, you're going to come, and I'm going to show these men how beautiful my wife is. And she said, no. How many of you would say no to that? Got some women going, yeah, no. Well, you don't say no to the king. And he was going to let it pass. But his advisors came to him and said, you know, king, if she gets away with us, this, what chance do the rest of us have with our wives? That's what he said. And he thought, and he went, hmm, good idea. So she was deposed, and he wanted a new wife. 
And if you are King Xerxes, if you're the king of the Persian Empire, you get to pick the best looking girls in town. And so he sent his soldiers out, kind of like Cinderella, you know, when they're looking to put the shoe back on her foot at the end of the story. They go from house to house, village to village, and they go to the home of Mordecai and Hadassah, and she was beautiful, and she was taken from her home. I doubt willingly, but she was taken from her home, taken to the palace, where then she gets the spa treatment for a year before she's allowed to go in front of the king. And the king goes, pretty, 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 oh, really pretty, and Esther was the one. Not that he didn't have all these women as part of his harem, but he loved Esther because of her beauty, and he made her his queen. And so Esther goes from living in poverty as basically an outcast in this empire, because she's a Jew, to living large in the palace. Within the palace, there are palaces within the palace, and she got the bigger ones because she made friends with the eunuch. And they took good care of her, and they loved her, because apparently she was as kind as she was pretty. And the king would call for her from time to time after he made her his wife. And she had a very comfortable life. He did not know she was a Jew. He didn't really have a problem with the Jews, but his henchman Haman certainly did. Haman, who was one of his ruling officials. Haman, who would get onto his horse and ride through the town, and he would expect everyone to bow to him, even though he was not the king. And Mordecai refused to bow. Why would Mordecai refuse to bow? He was a good Jew. He was only going to bow before his God. And Mordecai refuses to bow, and it just irks Haman to the point that he can no longer stand it. And he goes to Xerxes and gets him to write an edict, an edict, a law that is put into place, and once it's put there, it cannot be revoked, that says that the Jews will be exterminated. We've seen this happen throughout history, where someone gets the idea that we're going to exterminate the Jews. Well, Mordecai, earlier on, had saved Xerxes' life because he had overheard servants plotting to kill the king, and he sent word, and the king was rescued. And the story gets complicated, what's going to happen, and I'll let you read that on your own. But what I want you to focus on is what we just heard John read this morning. Because Mordecai finds out that there's a plot to exterminate the Jewish people. But he knows that Esther is in the palace. Esther is beloved by her husband because she is beautiful. That's really why he loved her. That's tough to write on your resume. Skills, good looking. <laughs> Experience, good looking. And he sends her word. That's the story we just read. You need to go to the king on behalf of your people. And Esther says, she sends word back, but if you are not called before the king and you just walk into the room when he's having his royal court, you will be put to death unless he holds his scepter out to you. And he says, the king has not called me for more than a month now. I don't think I'd want to go either, would you? If the king's way of doing things is if you, if you appear without being summoned, you're going to be put to death. And he wants her to go and not just go and ask the king to save her people, but in order to ask him to save her people, what does she have to do? She has to admit that she herself is a Jew. And Mordecai doesn't have a lot of patience with that, does he? He said, OK. If you don't speak up, God will send someone else. Someone else will raise up for your people. God's really not mentioned in this story. But perhaps God brought you to this place for such a time as this. For such a time as this. How many of you think we're living in some really rough times in the world? It's hard, isn't it, sometimes to turn on the news because you're going to get sick of what you see either what happens in our own Congress when people can't get along, or when we can't get along throughout God's creation in the world. We see people being cruel to each other, even around us in our midst. Social media, God help us all. Let me let you in on a little secret. You don't change anybody's mind by telling them they're stupid, OK? You don't change anyone's heart by beating them up over what they believe to be true or right. 
crime is all around us. I put on Facebook the other day, please don't tell my parents to keep me from living in places that they think are too scary for me to live. Don't, don't scare them like that. But we walk around with a certain amount of fear, don't we? Jesus knew about that too. Because what is he saying to his disciples? There are going to be wars, there's going to be insurrections, there's going to be trouble, you're going to be arrested, you're going to be put in prison. Some of you are going to be murdered, but don't worry. Because God will give you the words you need to speak in those times. God will be with you. Not a hair of your head will be hurt. Well, in the greater sense of things, we have a life with Christ that does not end. But we're going to face some scary times. I don't tend to despair over that. People say the world's worse now than it's ever been. I don't think so. They nailed our Lord and Savior to a cross. That's a pretty bad situation. Life has been hard from the beginning, and it continues to be hard for some people now, harder than for others sometimes. But you can be wealthy and have a beautiful house and home and everything you need, and then you get a diagnosis that will knock you off your pins. We cannot live in a world that has no challenges. But what if we listen to Mordecai, speaking not just to Esther, but to us? What if Mordecai is saying to us, which means God speaking through Mordecai is saying to us, maybe you were put here for exactly this time and this situation. Maybe that's why you're here, because times are tough, because we need someone as tough as you. We need someone who stands on the promises of God our Savior. Maybe this is why you're here. I read a story years ago, and I don't remember the name of the woman it was about, but she was talking about her life and how she had had two children and then had a little surprise later in life, and a son came along who was born severely disabled. He had Down syndrome, he had a heart condition, he had all sorts of problems. She was amazed at what people said to her, because when they heard about her son, all they said to her was, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. No one said, congratulations on having a baby boy. People said, I'm sorry. She was a woman who was a hard worker in her church, in her congregation. She and her husband were fairly affluent, gave a lot of money to the church. They put their money where their mouth was. They supported missions. They worked in a soup kitchen. They did everything. They went to Bible study. They were always in worship. They sang in the choir. They were people who had given their hearts and their lives to Jesus Christ. And someone said to her one day, I just can't believe that God would do this to you. Why you? That made her think. And she went home and she prayed and she thought to herself, when I met my husband, when he was just a college sophomore, crazy little skinny thing that he was then, and fell deeply in love with him, and we married, I didn't say, why me? Why me, Lord? Why would you do this to me? And when my daughter came along, who had all 10 fingers and toes that worked correctly, who grew up to become a teacher, she didn't say, why me, Lord? Why me? And when the next one came along, who ended up just being a lovely person, who went into the world and did great things for people. She said, I never said, oh, why me? And when we bought our first house, I didn't say, why me, Lord? And when we bought a bigger house, I didn't say, why me, Lord? And when my husband was very successful in his work, I didn't say, why me, Lord? So when this baby comes along who needs me with all his heart, what am I going to say? Why me, Lord? She said, that's when I said to the woman who talked to me, why not me, Lord? Why not me? Maybe God has called each person here for exactly this time. I, I wring my hands a little bit, which I don't like to do. I'd prefer to roll up my sleeves than wring my hands. But we've got some serious financial times ahead here at Epworth Church. Attendance is not where it used to be. Some people are looking back to the good old days and the good old pastors and the good old times that we had before. And some people are afraid for the future of the church, the United Methodist Church, God knows we may be at the verge of splitting. But there are others who are worried about the church universal because the number of people worshiping 
the number of families taking their children to church goes down every year and it shrinks and it shrinks and it shrinks and we think, why us, Lord? Why not us, Jesus Christ? Why not us here? Why not us? Because the world needs Jesus Christ and we have Jesus Christ. We need to get off our pews and into the streets and into the community and tell people about the life-transforming power of our Savior. Why not us? Tough lessons, huh? Jesus talking about the times that are to come, and they don't sound like a lot of fun, do they? That, that little apocalyptic business coming at us. People ask me often, are you afraid of dying? And I said, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not looking forward to the 15 or 20 minutes before, but being dead, no, I'm going to be with Christ. I'm okay with that. I don't know what challenges each of you have faced because I don't know all of you personally yet. I hope to. I hope to really be your pastor by hearing your story, hearing your struggles, hearing your triumphs, hearing how Christ is using you. I want to know that about everybody here, and I want you to know my story more and more as we get to know each other. But I want us together to be able to say, here we are, God, use us, send us. You've filled us and you've equipped us. Now it's our turn. Why not us, Lord? Because maybe, maybe, God has called us here together for exactly this time. And as long as we stand on those promises, we're going to get through. Esther's a fascinating book because God is really not mentioned in Esther. She asks for people to fast for her. But God isn't mentioned, but God is there. And you know why God is there? Because God's promises are still there for them. They're away from Jerusalem. They're away from the temple. They're away from the land of the promise. But the promise is with them wherever they are. And I can tell you this, it will be with each of you wherever you go every day from here on out because that is who God is in Jesus Christ. And I do believe he has called us for exactly this time and exactly this place. And that does not scare me at all. Bats, they scare me. The challenge of the ministry, God's got that covered. Amen.